Well, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, the brilliant minds. I've got Ron and Cindy Gula. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're, you're okay. too kind, too kind. <laughs> Thanks no, for having us. You're both doing so much work in, in our Dare I say cybersecurity data care industry. <laughs> um, it, it'd be great if you can each just share a little bit of background about uh, you know, what led you to the work that you're doing today with Gula Tech Ventures. Yeah, Cindy, why don't you go? Yeah, so uh, Ron and I are voluntarily related, is how I like to say it. Um, we got married in 97 and in 98, Ron came home and said, I got an idea for a company. My background, I'm an engineer, but I'm in glass engineering science, so nothing to do with cyber. Um, I did program, but in Fortran and Pascal. And, he, and I said, well, you know what? If we don't start a company now, we've always wondered what if. And so in 98, we started our first company, Network Security Wizards, which was an intrusion detection system called Dragon. We sold that to another company. We worked for Interesis Networks for a while. And then in 2002, we started Tunnable Network Security. Um, and that went public in July of 2018. Um, and then January of 2017, we started Gula Tech Adventures, and we we are a VC, a venture capitalist, but we knew we were going to do more than just in, um, investing in companies. So we we named it Adventures, so that we could have a lot of things under that umbrella. And so now we are enjoying um, many facets of Gula Tech Adventures, including investing in startup companies, Series A, Series B, even some Series C. Um, we invest in other funds. But we also have um, Gula Tech Foundation, which we're trying to treat nonprofits in the cyberspace very similar to startup companies and give them their uh, investment to get them to the next level, because we definitely understand cyber is not really quite understood by the uh, community. And the community likely go to a nonprofit before the enterprise to get more involved, which then flips us over to the thought of, we should call it data care. Um, to get more people uh, understanding they have a responsibility as well to care for their data. And it makes it much more approachable by the public in order to make sure that they're paying attention in doing something um, security-wise in their digital domain. Back to you, Rob. <laughs> well, that's a great intro. I don't think I yeah. need to add anything. I know that was actually very uh, comprehensive and thank you for sharing so much about uh, you know, the background and Gula Tech Adventures. Um, it, it's very clear how passionate both of you are um, about cybersecurity and just very curious, where did that come from? Um, did, you, did it start in an early age for maybe you, Ron? Um, Cindy, what about where it started for you? Would just love to learn more about uh, what was the trigger? That's funny. So my my dad uh, was a field engineer for for IBM. So he would actually work on the the really really large thirty eight hundred laser printer. So I had uh, IBM PC juniors and Atari computers, you know, growing up. And I always thought I was going to be going into you know computers, but I also liked liked to fly. Flying is a is a whole different different field, and it didn't really work out for me. But I got right back into computers. And, you know, I've always enjoyed complex systems and trying to make them, you know, really, really simple and easy to understand for other people. And I think the passion for cybersecurity, it's, it's a couple things. It's a little bit of giving back. I, I mean, the cybersecurity industry has really, um, you know, treated us really well. And I think we've really helped a lot of the different, uh, you know, innovations we've I mean, Cindy, Cindy and I will sit around and just talk about maybe some of the people who weren't in cyber who are in cyber now, you know, we were, that we were lucky enough to work with and whatnot, and that's great. But when we came out of Tenable Network Security, a lot of people said, hey, you know, can I start a, a cyber company like that? I want to have like thousands of cybersecurity ninjas, you know, working there. And, you know, Tenable has a lot of cybersecurity ninjas, but it also has lawyers and um uh, it, and just lawyers, right now, lawyers, sales, finance, you know, <laughs> finance, HR, it takes, it, it's a whole number of, of things. And, and so Cindy and I were really pushing this concept of, you know, if Maryland did something like 10 tenables or, you know, any state who wanted to do like economic development, they should start cyber product companies because one, the need's really, really huge. 
But two, you don't have to be a cyber ninja. You, you, you can be a, a, a lot of different, uh, what, what, are, what are perhaps non-cyber jobs. And, uh, and this really, really kind of, I think, can really not only help defend the country, but it can help the economy and keep America competitive on the world stage. Uh, and like I said, when I met Ron, he actually was in the Air Force, which, again, a lot of that military background of defend um, is really inherent. And everything I learned about cybersecurity was pretty much through osmosis, um, being brought into the community, listening, learning. Um, but the one thing I absolutely uh, really enjoy about it is that we're all on the same side. We're, it doesn't matter if we're competing, we're all trying to solve that, that problem or that issue for um, the public or companies and, and really defend um, ultimately the nation, but it does, it's, it's defending individual people as well and, and their safety and security. So it's, it's a really great industry to be associated with, um, but the, the issues are so complex and they're never ending. So it's just going to continue to grow and, and move um, faster and hopefully better as we continue. No doubt. And the community is, you know, as for as big as it is, it's also very small, like, you know, one big happy family almost. It makes us miss, I think, some of those in-person events to see all of our friends in the industry. Um, you've done a lot of work trying to get people into the cybersecurity field along your journey from coming from Tenable. And, you know, what hurdles, though, did you see as you were um, working towards that mission? I can give you a little bit of background, but then I'll let Cindy kind of pitch this concept called called data care. So, you know, when we came out of Tenable, we realized that workforce development for people entering the cybersecurity was, was a big issue. And we invested in a company called Cyberary, which, you know, has helped almost uh, more than 3 million people kind of at least get a certification among, among many other things. But we were also fairly involved and donated and spoke at, you know, nonprofits like, uh, like Year Up like, uh, like, like Empower. And we really were, were trying to really, you know, get this concept that, that there's, this is such an amazing career field and the, the cyber industry has done such a poor job talking about how exciting it is, what a great career it is, how, how important it is for the, for, for the country. And we realized after going on a tour of probably, I think Sin and I have been to about 15, maybe 20 different NSA cyber centers of excellence, community colleges, high schools, that we just started, started seeing a lot of the same issues and, and over and over again. And one, one day over coffee, you know, Cindy said, you know, we, we should really, you know, expand cyber to, to this thing called data care. And, and Cindy, why don't you talk about data care a little bit? Yeah, so I, I as a woman in, in cyber, constantly got asked, how do we get more people in cyber? And I'm like, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure I got here by osmosis. Um, but then I really started thinking about it and I started listening and I started talking and uh, research shows that women need to know the why before they start doing the what. But if you really look at the cybersecurity arena, Black Hat, uh, RSA, the conferences, we talk about what, 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 what all the time, but not necessarily the why. And then cybersecurity in and of itself as a word, what does it mean? It is so hard to relate in a personal way that it makes you even want to listen or, or, or think that that's something that you could do. So that's when I said, you know, we really, the medical field pivoted to healthcare. And when they did this, healthcare then took off. People could see themselves in healthcare. They didn't have to be a doctor. They didn't have to be the, the expert in, in that, but they are in healthcare. And so that's kind of where, again, the data care came. Like, well, let's pivot and look at what they did. And what that hopefully will allow people to do is understand they have a personal responsibility, but we also need people other than the quote unquote doctors. We, you know, the, the cyber experts, we need English people who can um, translate the technical to the understandable. We need artists who can work in marketing and, and other ways in order to, again, help people through this. We need gamers to gamify the whole learning process. We need educators, we need, we need a, a policy makers, legal, we need everything in order to approach this. And I think with data care, again, people can find their place 
easier because they can make it a personal journey of understanding. It's about protection and privacy. And generally, when you talk to anybody, they have some digital data that they want to have protected. And then they say, but how? And then they, you're, starting, you're answering the why, and then they start asking how. And I think that's just a better way to try to get more people into the industry. I couldn't agree more, especially with the why. It's, uh, I think that becomes more and more important. And, and I've been seeing a lot of that more lately. So hopefully more people are going to start with the why. Uh, and I, I will say we are big fans of Cyberay as well. So just wanted to <laughs> um, mention that too. Um, they've been great uh, when we've started working with them. Um, was this some of what, you know, that transition that in, or the concept of data care and the meaning that you were putting behind it? Was it part of, you know, I've heard you talk about cybersecurity and how it's not all that inviting. And, and was this part of why you started to transition to the concept and more clearly define it because of that? Right. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, absolutely. Um, and, and, and the industry, like Ron said, does a poor job describing even what we do. And if you look at the industry experts, they talk to each other about what they do, but not necessarily what they do to the general public. So it's a really difficult um, mismatch that the general public might think you have to be an expert to be in cyber, whereas you don't need to be an expert. And you can enter in a entry level. And it's one of the only fields out there that you, you can kind of control your own destiny by how much you want to learn and how much you want to build and how much you want to um, accomplish. So there, there's so much to promote and, and, and to um, be excited about. And it's not just one thing. That's the other, like a doctor. If you, you, know, if you need a, a, a problem with your eye, you're not going to go see any doctor. You're going to see a specialist. Well, cybersecurity is the same thing or data care. You can specialize forensics, blue team, red team, um, offense, defense. Um, policy. So there's a lot of different ways to approach, but we are not doing a great job communicating it and making it sound like it's an approachable um, field for, for everybody should be at least somewhat knowledgeable of. Yeah. And the, the cyber career, you know, we've done, like when, when we say we've done a bad job marketing it, let me, let me talk about some of the reasons for that. So you know, it's easy to say there's a lot of white men in cybersecurity, but but basically almost anybody's in cybersecurity is fairly technical. You know, they're they're from IT, they're programmers, they're things like that. Typically, those that 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 demographic is not somebody who's going to talk about career growth, social issues, you know, impact to the economy, that's that sort of thing. So so there's this vacuum of of our industry that just doesn't really have a lot of spokesperson. The biggest spokespersons are people with agendas, people that are vendors people that are the government and, and everything has been politicized and become, become a selling process. So the industry is really, you know, we don't have the equivalent of like a CDC, for example. We don't have the equivalent of like a Dr. Fauci who's speaking to the common person. And, and this has really not only made it hard for somebody who's outside of the cyber industry to, I, to enter it because they can't identify it. It's also hard for, you know, the, the average person to realize that this is another dimension that they have to deal with just, just like the earth, water, and the air. I mean, cyber and managing data is something that is in everything that people's touch. And we have not created uh, our school system. We have not created you know, Hollywood entertainment to talk about this in a, in a realistic fashion. So we really hope data care is a way to kind of solve a number of these issues. And we've gotten tremendous feedback on this concept from, actually the, the best feedback is from outside of cybersecurity, people who are inside cyber and who have positions of power and budget and stuff. They're kind of like, hey, don't touch my budget. I need, I need my $3 million as a cyber budget you know, next year. Don't take my cyber certifications away. But you know, I mean, Cindy actually got you know, some fan mail the other day from somebody completely outside the industry who says for the first time, I kind of understand where it all fits in and where it, where it starts. So. So we're pretty excited to keep pushing this and we hope people steal it. Like you're gonna see it more prominently on our webpage, but we didn't copyright it. There's no data care, you know, domain or anything like that. This is this is something I think the industry needs and should adopt. Yeah, and, and again, we have the playbook. The healthcare industry has Dr. Fauci. They've got the CDC for the public. And then they have state healthcare, health departments. Then they've got local 
health departments, and then they've got hospitals. So when somebody gets hurt or injured, they know where to go. So what happens when we get digitally hurt or injured? And, and so we have a, a playbook that we could just look at the years and years that they've been able to do training for the doctors, registration, certifications, structure. And so again, that's another reason to call it data care because there is so much similarity into the healthcare um, arena that already exists. That certainly is. And, you know, when you think about, like you mentioned, cybersecurity is threaded through just about every part of our lives. But at the same time, when you really start to dive a little deeper and figuring out all the specialty areas and then what certifications and pathways do you take, it, it becomes very complex. So simplifying it is, and for the, um, for those who no, are not in the industry to better understand it and, and helping to educate more is very, very important, which why that great work that you're doing in, in data care and making it more simplified it is so, so critical, I think. Um, Talk to us more, just, you know, share more, more about data care and uh, you've touched on it a little bit, but if you can take us kind of all through the journey and maybe what you might have uh, planned coming up, because this I think has been certainly evolving as you've uh, started out to define it more clearly for us and more simply. So at a high level, data care is all about awareness. It's awareness that there's a career field, which is a great career field. And it's also awareness that people have their personal responsibility to, to, to do more to protect their, protect their data. On the going into the career field, uh, of course, there's a minority discussion. You know, there's a whole, you know, if you look at African-Americans, if you look at, look at women, you just look at people who just aren't here. But at the same time, diversity means more than just race in many cases. You know, we, we might want a diverse set of, of uh, backgrounds, people from the city, people from the the farmland, people from urban urban areas, right? So we wanna get all people into these uh, positions. And the reason we need that, it's not just because we're being altruistic. It literally, cybersecurity is such a complex tapestry of risk-making decisions and, and, and lack of having 100% of the information. We really need a diverse team to make sure we ha are making the best decisions. And the decisions for a casino might be different than a hospital and different than a government agency. So we really need a lot of people to, to enter into this field and do that. And similarly, like I said before, raising personal responsibility. And this is, this is a tough one because a lot of times the cyber industry says, look, we need to automate this. We can't, you know, you can't make people responsible because you're gonna blame the victim. At the same time, you know, we're recording this just a week or two after the FBI you know, you could basically say hacked into a lot of computers to remove them. There's actually laws against that, but they got a DOJ order. The public needs to be understood, needs to have an understanding of these kind of issues. They need to understand that they have personal responsibility for buying products, for managing things like passwords. And if, if they haven't been educated, if they haven't been made aware of this, we, we, we want to fund programs to do these kind of things. Um, so there's a whole issue with public awareness. You know, where's that responsibility lie? What, what do you put out there? How much blame do you put on the vendors or the victims or the nation states or the, the role of government? We have not had this conversation in this country and we really hope data care can put a fine point on this and bring more people uh, to it. Um, Cindy, I, if, if I may, then I think the next phase to talk about is maybe some of the grants that we've been doing. Well, okay. I was going to make a different point, but just uh, teeing okay. you up there, teeing you up. Well, I, I think awareness, and I do want to make this point. Awareness is is similar yeah. to when the automobile was released. It didn't have seatbelts in it until people started crashing, and then they said, "Hey, you know what? Maybe seatbelts would be better." And the manufacturer said, "Fine, that's an extra. That is something you'll pay for extra, or we'll retrofit." And then people started having seatbelts, but then the manufacturers started putting seatbelts in, but it wasn't until there was a law that says you'll get it ticketed if you don't wear your seatbelt. But then what happened is that they started putting airbags and making cars more safe and actually, you know, displaying how the safe the car was. But the public demanded safer cars. The public understood I shouldn't have to pay for a seatbelt of a product that you're giving to me that I can crash in and hurt myself. So the public 
that's another part of that public awareness that Ron was talking about. If the public starts demanding that things are secure by co creation, then we're going to actually get somewhere. But until the, the vendors are, are held more accountable, as well as the public, I think then we'll be able to work towards a more um, secure internet, as long as we're all understanding and demanding that that's part of the playbook in the first place. But then now, thank you, Ron, for the foundation. I'm here all day. <laughs> so yeah, we, we had our first grant in January. It was increasing African-American engagement in cybersecurity. Um, we had some amazing submissions. Um, and luckily, our, our advisory board helped us narrow it down to three. Um, and we've done what we can, at least, to elevate and amplify their message. Um, Black Cybersecurity Association uh, was the ultimate first place winner. Um, oh, I get confused which one. Girl Security. Yeah, Empower and Girl Security. Girl Security um, was third, and then Empower was second. But again, they're just doing great work to go to people who, again, might not think that they are need to be in cybersecurity and educating them in different ways. Girl security specifically, it's not all about coding or, or anything. It's, it's bringing people from different backgrounds and bringing their entire experience to this networks, the, the national security arena for policy making and, and artistic and all those different ways that we've been saying we really need to get more people involved. And NPower just does a great job, um, again, introducing people into IT and, and into cybersecurity, people who just would never have thought that they had a, a role to play and um, doing really, really um, outstanding work to their trainees and getting them placed in great places that need the talent and then be able to work um, their way through the, the companies and hopefully up. Yeah, if, if I may, when we launched the foundation, what we what we set out to do was basically have competitive grant processes. So the and they were all topic based, and you know maybe in the future there's there's all going to be data care grants, but the but the first one was a very specific and very purposeful uh, grant focused on increasing African American engagement. So we had almost a hundred or so, uh, you know, people apply. We we announced some finalists, and and Cindy went through the the winners, but. We wanted to do this as a competition and be very purpose built because we wanted there to be, you know, a sense of like th these people are making a difference and they are, but we didn't just want to like just donate to, to people that, you know, Cindy and I met and got, got to know. We really wanted like our board to, to pick the winners and people to think about how they solve this problem. And now we're in this phase after this first grant where, you know, we've got them they spoke at a number of conferences. They're, they've, they've recorded videos for RSA. They were a guest of uh, Unicon, which is Scythe and uh, Grimm's conference. They all got to kind of talk about what they what they were doing there. Uh, they've got some media coverage, and uh, this is this is a real this is beyond our expectations at this point. We were we we would have been just as happy to kind of give a little bit of you know mentorship and and and, and some money, but to expose them uh, to the community, I think, is really really good. Uh, now, Cindy, maybe you want to talk about we're in our second grant right now. Yeah, so the second grant is uh, increasing cybersecurity awareness, i.e. data care uh, in the public. And we're really excited because we left it a little more open just to see what kind of creative things people are doing. Um, you know, clearly kindergarten through 12, a lot of people think of education in, in that arena, and that's great. But we have so many more people who are already in the digital domain that they need, you know, education as well. We need our seniors educated. We need um, bringing people in uh, again, trying to get them excited. Maybe they're second careers. Maybe they're veterans. They already have that that um, inherent protective um, desire, and so the cybersecurity is a natural flow over uh, to them. But there, there's just so many different ways. So we're we have whittled it down to 17 and it's currently in our advisory board is is going through and reviewing those now and we look to announce it in um may 20th at the rsa conference so we're we're really excited that rsa has joined with us and and giving us the platform um to help promote again these nonprofits, challenge not challenge but challenge people who are in the cybersecurity arena 
to come help these nonprofits to, to also talk about what they do, what their careers are, how and why it's so exciting so we can attract even more people into the industry. That is just, I mean, amazing work. I can't say that enough, that um, the efforts that you all are putting into it, the funding to, you know, I think we're still solving for a lot of challenges and, and problems in this area, but the incremental change that you've been able to make has been great. And we need, you know, I know it's one of those longer term problems that, but every, you know, in, bit of impact does definitely help. Um, question though, for you guys on just, you know, organizations who are focused on workforce development and building apprenticeship programs for cybersecurity or data care, but what advice do you have or can you share for them as they educate employers on what, you know, apprenticeship or that sort of model truly could mean, but how it can be applicable in a data care career, if you will, if that makes so this, sense. This is a tough question because, you know, the intent of wanting to train somebody who's not in this field to get them a job in this field is a very noble attempt. Yes. Um, how do we make that happen, right? So there's, there's we can all go to Harvard you know, if we all get into Harvard, we can get a computer science degree and a cybersecurity degree from Harvard University. That does not scale for the country. At the same time, there's lots and lots of nonprofits out there where there might be one instructor, you know, who's the instructor, the CEO of the company and, and the trainer. And maybe that person just through sheer will of their own, you know, trains 20, 20 young students a year. Maybe it's K through 12. And in between that, you've got every variation that we've seen. You, we've got some companies where they're entirely funded because they've gone to corporate America. I said companies, some organizations. They've gone to corporate America and said, look, we are going to bring you 5,000 cybersecurity certified people and you're going to hire them ahead of time. We're going to take your money. We're going to go into this program and do it. Other programs are 100% philanthropic. Other programs are hybrid. Maybe they focus on capture the flag. My point is, just like there's 50 states in, in America, and there's many, many different ways to get people into this system and different funding and different, there's a lot of those out there. So whoever's watching this right now, you might be in rural Wisconsin or rural Maryland, and there might be a program from your state that says you could go to community college and take these cybersecurity courses and get paid for free. Uh, you know, just, just down South from where Cindy and I are, Arundel, uh, Anne Arundel County, They've got a program in place where if you're getting, you know, uh, CSSP, ISC Square type certification, they will compensate your employer. So it, it, there's there's all these different levels of of, of that sort of stuff. Uh, Cindy and I kind of there's a lot of commercial for training companies, and they will come to us for funding. And there's a lot of nonprofits who come to us for funding, and we look at Cybrary as sort of our baseline. Uh, we know what it takes to train 3 million people, at least get them certified. And, you know, often if someone's coming to us asking for, hey, can you donate $100,000? We're like, well, yeah, but we could have also just bought, you know, $100,000 worth of, of, of cyber classes and given that to like maybe a small college or something like that. So um, we tend to look at these things as being very, what's the level of efficiency and what's the desired outcomes? Cindy, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, and, and again, there, not everybody is going to be the person coding the program. You've got people who create the program and they are in cybersecurity. You've got people who operate the products and they're in cybersecurity. And you've got people who educate salespeople, marketing, that type of thing of why you would need this, this product. So, so there, there's a misconception that the workforce development is singular. Um, one reason that we really like Cyberry as well is if you don't even know what you want, you can, for free, you can go down a forensics trail to see if you like to do that. You can go down the defending trail. If you happen to hear the word firewall and say, hey, I want to learn more about my firewall and router, you can go and, and educate yourself that way because it is going to take that passion in order to continue for that, that trainee to want to continue to learn. It's, it's not a, an industry that if you just slug through and, and learn everything that you're gonna enjoy it. 
Um, there really is so many things to do that finding something that really lights your passion is, is you know, what I would definitely suggest. Um, so there's different ways to, to get into cybersecurity and it's not all about coding. Um, and that's, so, so we need coders though. We need developers. We need people who can, can do that. But we also need a lot of other people, user interface. You can build the best products in the world, but if you can't use it, if the public can't use it, no one's going to use it. So that user interface is, is really important. So there's, again, so many different ways and reasons and, and types to get into this that it's, it's more difficult to not find something if you really try. Yes, no, cyber is definitely very comprehensive. And I think also to your point, we're always be learning, always be evolving, um, that there's definitely, you know, no doubt that men, we need to focus on that too. Um, you know, looking at training though, but then more into so K through 12 and college and just curriculums in general, um, where do you think we can evolve um, across all uh, levels, uh, starting at K, you know, kindergarten and on up. And what would you recommend changing? Do, do you think we'll see someday um, data care in all curriculums at all grade school levels? I, I, I absolutely. And again, I'm going to take this from the healthcare. As kindergartners, we learn how to wash our hands. We, we learn why it's important to brush our teeth. We learn all of these things as hygiene. And you learn it from kindergarten right through 12. I mean, we have specific um, maturity levels and understanding what different things people are able to understand. And so we need to get that cyber hygiene, that digital, and then a, an addition, digital citizenship with that, um, introducing the idea of risk at a very young age. I mean, we tell them right now, you know, how many times you, if your friend jumped off the um, cliff, would you jump to mentality and you have to measure your risk? Well, that's the same thing with digitally. If we can start getting them younger and understanding there's a risk profile that they have to identify um, that not all things on the internet are good um, and, and being able to determine which one um, that is and then continuing with more sophisticated hygiene and then understanding, you know, Ron likes to say, we teach it how to balance your checkbook and finance, um, financial health. Well, there's gotta be a digital health. How do you keep, you know, learning about yourself? How do you check things up online? How do you make sure that they're accurate, correct? And then this gets back to the public. If the public is actually demanding that there is digital data care, like true data care, that my data is mine, then it helps the um, politicians and the, the regulators write rules that govern that the data is mine. I have an expectation of privacy and protection. And then what can you do with those, that data? So, so I completely agree that there's that the healthcare mantra on how they introduce health into the kindergarten through 12 and continue on certainly has that. And then digital citizenship and, and, ethics, responsibility, um, right, right up into that. So I, I see that it's, it's got to come sooner than later. Um, hopefully we're involved in a couple of things that will help bring it sooner than later, but it's, again, it's got to be a willingness of the school system as well. I have a couple of things to add on that. So the, the example that, that Cindy was talking about that I really like to say is we, we talk about banks and credit, you know, banks, we give them our money, they, it's still our money, but they do things with it. And we get slightly more money back. We get some benefits from that. And credit, we take other people's money. We pay interest on that. And, and you know, we get some convenience for that. But we don't ever teach people how that works with data. You know, the, when we put data at Facebook or in social media, we don't talk about why that could be good, why that could be bad. And I think we really need to go there. And then a little bit more higher level, I, I think, you know, the school system, it, it did a good thing bringing engineering and math. You know, we have STEM and Cindy and I are very much friends of, of STEAM. We like, we like, we, we think all engineering is art at the end of the day, but we really missed an opportunity to really bring in digital. And, you know, I don't think we could have STEAMed or esteemed or, you know, some other acronym in there, but it's almost too late right now because with COVID, um, you know, the whole school system 
you know, even though now they're all virtual and they're doing it remotely, there's really no chance to change that curriculum, even though now would be the most perfect time to bring in digital stuff because we're all being home, you know, Zoom bomb, mom and dad are the IT team. Now we're all sharing Wi-Fi. We're all, you know, uh, you know, doing things over the web. And, you know, I think this is going to last for a while and it probably really makes sense to, to redo STEM and bring that in. But it's, you know, I get it. Money's tight and we don't have the people that are, that are, that are out there now. Having said that, there are places like Cybrary. If Cybrary had another 3 million users show up and they were all in K through 12, they can do it just fine. They can handle the curriculum. They can, they can do that kind of stuff. I, I wouldn't want to send kindergarten people through Cybrary, but the point is, I think, I think there's a lot of ways to supplement the current school system. And uh, we, should, we should definitely be encouraging anybody to do that. Well, and I think to what your point is around uh, you know, the concept of data care and the meaning behind it and being more universal through for everyone as a consumer, not just us working in the profession or in, in the workforce, but to everyone where it's applicable and kind of like your analogy with the automobile industry, the more people that are educated and can understand it, maybe the wider we hope that spreads into then making that change. So we start to see some of that evolution and you know, starting as young as um, kindergarten and, and on up that we need to see. Um, this has been you know, so great to have you both here again and sharing about data care and the work that you're doing and you know, the grants that you have to support um, other organizations that are driving this. I know it takes a village with this um, effort. Uh, I guess lastly to close out is where, if folks wanna reach out to you or learn more, how, how can they get a hold of you and um, help support on this mission and get your support as well? So the last name is Gula, G-U-L-A, and the website is gula.tech, T-E-C-H. So we have everything up there. We have a blog. We have a show called Gula Tech Cyber Fiction. We have uh, all of our portfolio companies. We have all the winners of the foundation, and uh, we keep that updated. And uh, we're more than happy to, to talk to people if they want to connect with us on Twitter and, uh, and LinkedIn. And hopefully we will be doing a themed foundation grant for any nonprofit kind of watching this. And our focus is really to put people through the foundation process. Mm -hmm. But uh, we always do enjoy hearing from the great work people are doing across the entire cyber industry, whether it's a startup or a nonprofit. And I just want to, again, plug Gula Tech Cyber Fiction. Mm -hmm. um, we, we say a lot that we need to get access more to the public. So one of the things we do love to do is to talk to non-cyber people about cyber. Um, we have a, a couple of NFL football players that we've, we've talked with. We have um, Hollywood. We actually knew something about cyber. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and we talked about Hollywood. There's a new MacGyver on CBS. We actually got to interview and, and talk with the, the cast of MacGyver. Um, again, talking about how you know, Hollywood is portraying the industry and, and just their perceptions. So we, we are trying to do more of pulling in the public and having that conversation, inviting them, being very, very purposeful, inviting them into the data care arena because they're in it. You know, their data is in it. They, they better, you know, they, they, they need to, to understand that they can do things to protect themselves, that it's not hopeless that, you know, yeah, your credit card may have been stolen once, twice. It doesn't matter, but you're in this because the data needs to be yours. We need, this is not going to go away. It's not going to slow down. It's only going to go faster. It's only get more out there. So we really need the public to, to, to start having the conversation of what that means and what that means long-term, if not directly for us, for, for the next generation. Could not agree more on everything. And uh, again, the message is, is wonderful. And I know it's spreading, um, and I just am excited to see where all of this goes in the future. But um, for everyone watching, you saw where you can uh, uh, reach out to them. And was Cyber Fiction, was that what it was called? Rule of Tech, Cyber, Cyber Fiction. Fiction. Yep. Neon logo I'm and everything. Start watching more of that too, because you do you you bring in so many great guests. It's a, it's unbelievable. So, I want to thank you both though today for coming and sharing more about data care and some of your personal initiatives on getting involved and um, all the great work that you're doing to support the broader community and um, all of us, at, no matter what profession we're in, and educating us. Thank you so much for being here today with us. 
Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Best of luck.